family, the comfort, safety, morals, health, and pr prosperity of its citizens by preserving the public order and preventing a conflict of rights in the common intercourse of the citizens and ensuring to each an uninterrupted enjoyment. Everybody will get that word, enjoyment? of all the privileges conferred upon him or her by the general laws, the Constitution, the power of the state to place restraints on personal freedoms and property rights of persons for the protection of the public safety, health, and morals, or to promotion of the public convenience and general propriety. The police power is subject to limitations of the federal and state constitutions, and everybody catch that, and especially to the requirements of due process. Police power is the exercise of the sovereign right of the government to promote order, safety, security, health, morals, and general welfare within constitutional limitations, right, is an essential attribute. Marshall versus Kansas City, Missouri, recorded at 35 volume, Southwest 2nd, that's another reporter, Southwest 2nd, page 877, all right? Now, police powers are the right of eminent domain of a state or political subdivision to enact laws for the common good and welfare and to curb crime within constitutional limitations. And the key words in that whole thing are within constitutional limitations. And then it tells you to see the Tenth Amendment. And when you see the Tenth Amendment, and believe it or not, you can go look up the books and it divides the Tenth Amendment real... Here, pull over here. All right. The burdens placed on the national government as a result of states regulation, okay, regulation of their internal affairs, save as Congress may act to remove them, constitute normal incidents of operation within the same territory of a dual system of government. And no immunity of national government from such burden is to be implied from the Constitution, all right? All right, Penn Diaries versus Milk Control Commission, all right, a Pennsylvania case, recorded at United, uh, Volume 318, U.S. 261. The people of the United States residing within any state are subject to two governments, one state and the other national. But there need be no conflict between the two because the powers which one possesses, the other does not. That's United States versus Crookshank, a very famous Supreme Court case. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, we come over here. Within the area of delegated powers, expressed or implied, this amendment does not reduce the powers of the United States. That's U.S. versus Manning. Recorded at 215 Federal Supplement. That's another reporter, page 272. The Federal Union has only those powers expressly conferred on it and those reasonably implied from powers granted, while each state has all governmental powers except such as the people by the Constitution have conferred on the United States, denied to the state or reserved to the people themselves. Anderson v. Gladden, recorded at Volume 188, Federal Supplement 666. That's a bad number. <laughs> All right. It is when federal legislation attempts to confer power upon the national government that it is not within it's not within the express or implied powers given by the Constitution that the legislation becomes vulnerable to this amendment. Okay? Now, what are we talking about here? Brady Bill, huh? <sighs> They're not within their powers. They have no Tenth Amendment powers to take away the Second Amendment. Does that make sense to everybody? They don't have any powers to go and take away the, t the Second Amendment or any other amendment. The Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, nothing. And the Ninth Amendment precluded them from adding on to the Constitution in such a way that would take away the powers. So by the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment, they're totally locked out from doing a lot of the things that they do. But see, you've got to know that and be able to timely exercise it. So it's very important to understand your Tenth Amendment powers. Now, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary and proper, <clears throat> and this is what we did... This is what we did to uh, help out Dr. Kevorkian. We made sure that his lawyer got this knowledge. We went in there and we dug up a writ of Quo Waranto. A writ of Quo Waranto. All right? Now, this doesn't look like much, but let me tell you something. What we're talking about doing here, 
See, most cities, at least in the state of Michigan, are by Public Act 230 Public Acts or Public Act 287 of Public Acts, and in every one of them there is a rights and powers section. Usually it's recorded at 2.2 or 3.1, and it basically says, and I quote, subject to the Constitution of the United States and the general laws of the state of Michigan, the city of or the township of has rights and powers too. And then it starts listing the rights and powers. Uh, right to have a police department, right to have a fire department, right to have a city hall, right? And it starts listing all these powers. Now, the antithesis to the argument is that if they're not within the Constitution of the United States and the general laws of the state of Michigan, they don't have any rights and powers. Does that make sense to everybody? In other words, they're in violation of their corporate charter, their franchise. They promised they would be within the Constitution of the United States and the general laws of the state of Michigan. Now, a lot of people uh, they don't understand the power of this argument, so I want to really push this one home. I want you to understand. Whenever these little townships and these little cities and what have you, they start acting like King Farouk and that you're, you're, you don't matter and that they don't got to listen to you, this is what I want you to do. You ask them a point question and ask them, are you violating my constitutionally secured civil rights by however you claim they are? Because if you are, you have just waived your right to be the city of. And they'll laugh at you for a little bit, okay? Then you explain to them Public Act 230 of Public Acts, which states the rights and powers section, subject to the Constitution of the United States and the general laws of the state of Michigan. You have rights and powers. The antithesis to that argument is if you're not going to be within the Constitution of the United States or the general laws of the state of Michigan and you're going to violate my constitutional rights and trample my rights, what we're going to do here is we're going to go for a writ of mandamus in quo warranto. Well, that's a legal term, fancy legal term. But it is an ancient law that goes way back to England in the ancient times. And basically, here is a judgment and a capious action for it, all right? You put down here the case. The case came on regularly for trial before the Honorable, and you put the judge's name in there, whatever it is, on a jury trial or a non-jury trial, dated such and such. The name appeared as for your counsel, and the name appeared for opposing counsel, right? The court heard the testimony and examined the proofs offered by the parties. The court considered itself fully advised in the premise, filed in its findings of fact and conclusions of law, and directed that judgments be entered in accordance with such findings, right? Which means they figured out that they violated your constitutional rights, they didn't have a right to violate your constitutional rights, and in the hearing you showed they violated your constitutional rights, and the judge figured out they violated your constitutional rights. So now, for your prayer for relief, we're going to get this quo warranto. And this is exactly what happened to the Honorable Doctor. Kevorkian. You'll notice that he was in jail and they were hammering the tail at him. The next thing you know, everything got real quiet. Nobody said nothing. And then the next thing you know, they were letting him go and they were minding their business. Now, this is how it happened. It is therefore ordered and adjudged and decreed. <clears throat> One, defendant corporation, the city of, you put down what name, has violated provisions of the act under which it was created and also has violated provisions of Public Act 230 of Public Act Section 2.2, Rights and Powers Section. In other words, it didn't uphold the Constitution of the United States or the general laws of the state of Michigan. Defendant Corporation, the city of whatever, Pontiac, whatever, accordingly has forfeited its charter and become liable to be dissolved by the abuse of its power. How much money am I talking about here, folks? We'd be in about nine decimal places plus, wouldn't you, don't you think? Now, do you think they're going to bother some little doctor when they're looking at shutting down a major city? What do you think is going to happen? Everything's going to get quiet and they're going to let the good doctor go. Same thing for you. Now, <clears throat> defendant corporation, you name them, therefore is dissolved and the corporate rights, privileges, and franchise of defendants are declared forfeited to the people. Defendant corporation, you name them, is trustees, directors, managers, and other official officers, attorneys, and agents are forever restrained and enjoined from exercising any of the corporate franchise powers, rights, and or privileges previously exercised by defendants at city and from collecting or receiving any debts and or demands belonging to or held by defendant, city, whatever, and from paying out or in any manner interfering with, transferring, or delivering to any person any of the deposits, money, securities, property, and effects of the defendant city or held by it. You name a trustee, which the state would do, probably the attorney general, after your complaint is filed, is appointed receiver of all of the property, real and personal things, in action and effects 
of Defendant City Corporation held by and vested in defendants